I'm Caroline Atkinson, Senior Global Strategist at uh, Rock Creek Asset Management Group, and I'm delighted to be joined today by Bill Dudley, Chairman of the Bretton Woods Committee, although also well known, of course, as former President of the uh, Federal Reserve Bank of New York, and Rory McFarquhar, Chief Economist of Gemstock Hedge Fund, and former uh, National Security Advisor, uh, National Security Council member, and uh, other jobs that he's had, uh, generally a macroeconomist. So I'd like to start with you, if I may, Bill. Sure. Uh, we've had the Fed raise rates uh, by an enormous amount over a short period of time, and we've had predictions of recession from many as a result. And it hasn't happened. In fact, in the third quarter, growth at an annualized rate was almost at 5%. So is the recession still to come? Or why were we all so wrong? I think we're wrong because the uh, pandemic resulted in very large fiscal transfers to the business and household sectors. So they were in much better financial sh shape at the end of a business cycle than what people were really, than what's typical. And so consumers in particular had plenty of resources to continue to spend. And when the economy opened up, that's exactly what they did, especially on services. So I think the household sector just had a lot more uh, durability in terms of uh, what typically occurs. And that's what, what's been pushing back uh, any timing of recession. Now, whether we're gonna have a recession or not, uh, you know, is anybody's guess. Uh, the Fed is obviously trying to go for a soft landing. Chair Powell was asked about it at recent press conferences, and he, and he said, uh, basically, the staff, the staff at the Fed is not calling for a recession. So they're hoping that they can cool the economy off without actually turning, to generating an economic downturn. I think the answer to that question of whether they can really depends on how much do they have to loosen up the labor market to get inflation back down to 2%. There's a very interesting historical regularity in the US. Every time the unemployment rate rises by more than about a half a percentage point, you end up having a full-blown recession. That's the so-called SOM rule. Uh, we're getting pretty close to that trigger point. Uh, so if the Fed actually does have to push the unemployment rate up to, say, four and a quarter, four and a half percent to get inflation back down to two percent, uh, we're, we're probably going to actually have a full-blown recession. But it yes, doesn't seem like it started. You referred to the SOM rule, and of course, uh, many rules have been broken during uh, many regularities, economic regularities have turned out to be different in this uh, recovery or post-recession uh, period. Rory, do you go along with Bill's view that it was really the consumer and the delayed impact of the fiscal uh, push here that has postponed a recession or maybe stopped it altogether? I mean, one thing that's really extraordinary in at this point in the business cycle is that the U.S. is running a sim simply enormous budget deficit, and you know that's in some ways quite scary because you know when unemployment is as low as it is, when um, the economy seems to be in extremely robust shape as it it was in the third quarter, and as there's you know every reason to think is is, is going to continue. Um, perhaps at a slightly less uh, torrid pace in, in, in upcoming quarters. The, the idea that, that we're running, you know, what may be around 7% of GDP budget deficit, um, you know, one can only imagine what would happen if we actually did go into recession and the automatic stabilizers of the tax system and, and the, the spending system kicked in you know, we would be potentially in double digits as a budget deficit. So, you know, clearly that is part of the explanation for why why um, the economy has been so robust. I mean, I think that was a great surprise to a lot of people that the budget deficit actually widened in 2023. Um, a part of that was, a large part of that was on the revenue side, a few one-off items, but still it's clear that the overall fiscal policy has been very supportive through, you know, quite late into this uh, into this recovery. And so your concern, just to follow up on that, is that eventually this will lead to inflation or eventually it will uh, mean that interest rates really go up a lot long term because of the government is crowding out, a bit like the arguments of the 1990s. 
I mean, I think it's really an extreme version of the latter that uh, we are going to need to find buyers for a very large quantity of bonds. And you know, one thing that was very striking uh, in the last couple of weeks was that the um, Treasury Department announced how it was going to do its its borrowing for the first quarter of the year. And the big surprise was that to a very large extent, it is borrowing at the very short term in treasury bills rather than um, in, uh, in, in, in longer term notes and bonds. And the significance of that is that essentially what the treasury is doing is drawing on the excess liquidity that the Fed is sitting on as a result of some of its pandemic programs. It knows that that money is available to it. And so if it if it issues this, these short-term bills, there's not gonna be any disruption in the bond market. But this is only putting off the inevitable because at some point it's going to have to issue longer term debt. And, and then the question is who's gonna buy it? The Chinese are not the buyers of last resort anymore. The J Japanese are not buying a lot of bonds. Um, the Fed isn't buying uh, bonds like it like it was in, uh, in in recent years, and so all of a sudden, the Treasury is going to actually have to attract bond bond buyers that that really care about how much they're being paid, um, and that what, could be yeah. a very big change from the last fifteen years. That's certainly a big change, and that's a lot to do with the uh, arguments that some people make that we are going to have interest rates that are higher for longer, not just longer in a few months, in this case of a few months, but longer in terms of years. And I'd like to get Bill's take on that. And also, yeah, the Chinese won't be the buyers of last resort. Japan won't be the buyers of last resort. But what about Americans? Because there's certainly a shift now with people thinking, oh, maybe I uh, would prefer to keep my money safely in treasuries and in bonds than uh, play the stock market in the way that happened uh, in the 2010s and up to, to the pandemic. Bill, what, what do you say to that? Well, I still think we depend on the kindness of strangers to finance a good portion of our budget deficits. Uh, if you look at the US, it's been running chronic current account deficits for many, many, many years. It continues to run a, a current account deficit, which basically means our uh, investment is higher than our domestic savings. And the federal government obviously is part of that. So I, I think it is really important that we uh, continue to run good economic policies that attract foreign uh, investors. And we're doing a number of things that are making uh, the U.S. somewhat less attractive. Uh, one, as Roy has pointed out, being on an unsustainable fiscal path is not a good place to start. But two, the use of sanctions uh, in response to the Russian invasion of Ukraine uh, is one of the reasons why countries like China are now more nervous about uh, holding a lot of their reserve currency in U.S. dollars because they worry if there's a, 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 a spat about Taiwan, uh, the U.S. could put sanctions on China and that their holdings of treasury securities could be locked up. So I think there's lots of things to worry about here. I certainly agree with Rory that this is on an unsustainable trajectory and it's going to blow up at some point. The hard part is to figure out exactly when. I would say the rise in bond yields that we've seen this year is not the bond market vigilantes returning. I think it's more just the weight of issuance and the fact that the US economy is strong. And to your, to your point that you made just a, bit, a little bit while ago, it looks like uh, you know, the interest rates consistent with a stable economy are higher than they were back following the great financial crisis. You know, the so-called R star, the neutral rate consistent with uh, you know, a neutral monetary policy seems to have increased. And you can see that based on the performance of the economy we can also see it on what's happening to the balance between savings and investment, a lot less savings because of the federal government and a lot more investment uh, driven by things like the Biden administration's CHIPS Act, infrastructure spending bill, um, you know, the conversion of, of the whole motor vehicle productions from internal combustion engines to, to battery operated cars. So is that does that add up to something that is bad or something that is good with more investment leading maybe to more productivity and a stronger economy going going forward? I must say that if one looks at the performance, the economic performance in Europe, uh, where there's Germany has been in recession, probably the major economy there and the whole area may slip into recession. Uh, the U.S., I think they would 
happily exchange their situation for that of the US with stronger growth. But is that, are we riding for a fall? Well, the Germans are very dependent on the motor vehicle sector and that sector is going through very intensive change. And they're also very connected to China in terms of what's happening to the domestic demand in China. Uh, we're less, you know, motor vehicle sector is much less important in the US and our links to China, our direct links to China, from a you know consumer demand in China feeding back to the U.S. is very very weak. So you don't see, and maybe I can turn to Rory on just on China and on what's happening in the rest of the world. Is that a big, uh, which is on the whole growing more slowly than than here? Well, China may grow more rapidly than here, but much more slowly than had been expected. Uh, is that something that is a concern for? Uh, for the U.S. economy and U.S. stocks, U.S. companies, or as Bill said, are we sufficiently insulated as a, as a big, uh, relatively closed economy that we don't need to worry about that too much? We clearly need to worry about the rest of the world less than the rest of the world has to worry about us. But it's not to say that we don't have to worry about it at all. I mean, the dollar has been extremely strong. Um, has the potential to get even stronger in the coming year if if um, U.S. interest rates do rise in line. You know, basically what it implies is that the the U.S. will be sucking the savings out of the rest of the world to fund this enormous budget deficit. I mean, just like a couple of numbers. So, in, if you look at um, at 2023, the U.S. budget deficit 1.7 trillion dollars. U.S. household savings, $700 billion. So that's a, a trillion dollars that has to come from somewhere yeah, to, elsewhere. yeah. So, so, um, but, you know, obviously, obviously the, um, the disappointing growth in China, the, the recession in Germany and the, and the, the really slow um, recovery in, in the rest of Europe, that is on balance a, a drag on the US, but the US is, has just proven remarkably resilient so far. And, you know, so as, as of today, it, it just does not seem like, like these, these headwinds from the rest of the world are really having any measurable impact on the US economy. Yeah, Bill, I want to go back to you and uh, let's remember why we have these high interest rates. As I said at the beginning, the Fed raised rates very sharply because inflation was surging in 2021-2022. Many people, uh, you included, thought that the Fed acted a bit late, um, but they did act. And yet uh, inflation has come down, but the economy has stayed strong and unemployment is not quite yet hitting the, the SAM rule and is certainly lower than it has been for uh, on average for many years. So you recently argued for that the Fed's pause in rates, they haven't raised rates since uh, the July meeting, was a mistake. They paused for two meetings. Why do you think it was a mistake? I mean, aren't you pleased with, uh, shouldn't we be celebrating that we've had this decline in inflation? I didn't quite say it was a mistake. I said it could be a mistake ah. from a management ah. perspective, taking a lot of risk here. So let's imagine that the scenario plays out that the economy keeps growing and inflation uh, sort of stabilizes around 3%. If that, in that environment, inflation expectations will probably start to become unanchored. And the Fed will have not finished the job, just like Arthur Burns did not finish the job in the 1970s. So I think from a risk management perspective, it's better if the Fed overdoes it a bit to make sure that they accomplish their goals on inflation, rather than try to be too cute and go for a soft landing, which might mean that they're not tightening monetary policy sufficiently to get to 2% inflation in a timely manner. I mean, we've been about 2% inflation now for three years. Uh, we, we've been lucky that inflation expectations have stay, stayed so well anchored. Every year we stay above 2% inflation. The risk is that that uh, will not be sustained. And do you think that, is there something special about 2% or are you, are there a number of economists who, who argue, well, uh, maybe 3% would be fine, but it might be bad for credibility to uh, announce a shift to 3%. What, what's your view on, on that? I would say two things. Number one, I would say a shift to, from, from 2% to 3% that was explicitly made would be very damaging to the Fed's credibility. 
you're basically moving the goal post because you're having trouble achieving your objective. And of course, if you move the inflation objective once, uh, you can obviously move it again. And so it'd be hard to re-anchor expectations even around 3% inflation if you, if you did that. I don't think they're going to move the inflation objective. I think the, 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 the motivation for doing that has actually diminished quite considerably. Now that interest rates are five and a quarter to five and a half, the Fed has plenty of room to cut interest rates to stimulate the economy and should the U.S. economy uh, encounter a recession. This isn't the situation following the great financial crisis where there's so much damage to households and businesses and balance sheets that the, you know, the, the nominal short-term rates only climbed up to around 2%. And the Fed was really worried about not having enough room to actually stimulate the economy during the next economic downturn. So I think they have plenty of room to, to move. I think the economy is fundamentally not in that bad shape. Uh, if the Fed started to cut rates, the economy, I think, would come back pretty quickly. So the risk of being pinned at the zero lower bound for interest rates have diminished uh, considerably. And on that point, Rory, the um, a, a number of people have said that they're concerned, actually, that there may be, uh, and we discussed, there may be a recession, there may be unemployment, maybe will go up a lot. So we do seem to be uh, kind of balanced on a knife edge in a way between economists saying, as Bill uh, said, maybe it's risky not to keep raising rates because uh, it would be very dangerous if inflation started to re-accelerate. Uh, and people who are thinking, actually, we could be about to topple into a recession with unemployment uh, rising. And then once you get that uh, cycle happening, it's much harder to stop. Where, where do you see the balance on this one? So as investors, we have to think about all of these scenarios and essentially probability weight them. Um, there's, you know, a probability of, of of a recession in any given year, and often, looking back, these recessions were not anticipated until you know very shortly, or sometimes only when when, in retrospect, they were already underway. Um, that said, you know, looking at the balance, looking at the 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 the, the recent data, and we're you know we're recording this on on. November 13th, we're going to get an inflation number out you know, tomorrow morning. And, and that's going to give us some indication of whether we, have, we are on a benign downward inflation trend, as we seem to be over the summer, and in which case the, the needle threading that the Fed has tried to do will start to look more successful and effective but there's also the risk as as bill indicated that the the inflation indicators are going to be um actually quite stubborn and you know core inflation hasn't really been on a clear declining path of a, over certainly the the most recent period there are some indicators that some some components of the uh inflation index that could actually be moving in the wrong direction. And, and so as a result, we may, be, we may be at the bottom of where inflation goes, in which case, you know, certainly we, we, could, we could be going into 2024 with a quite healthy economy and stubborn inflation above, you know, maybe a, a percentage point above, above the Fed's target, or maybe even more, in which case the Fed will probably have to, I mean, I will obviously defer, defer to the former Fed official on this, but the Fed might be, you know, having trouble explaining why it is not doing more. And, so yeah. but, you know, that we could also see the opposite dynamic. It's just that the opposite dynamic, the, the recessionary dynamic, I mean, if you look across uh, Wall Street forecasters, you know, many of whom forecast a, a recession at some point in 2023, then gradually pushed it out into 2024. And a lot of them have just removed it altogether now. A little bit like the Fed staff. So there's a question of wh wh who just for one, I think one of the uh, quarterly forecasts, they had put in a recession, even though it wasn't clear that the policymakers bought into that uh, picture. I is there any uh, fear that just when everybody decides that there is unlikely to be a recession, one comes. I mean, is is there any evidence from the past that? Oh, absolutely. Uh, 
Absolutely. I mean, if you look at the look at the great financial crisis, we actually went into recession when they when all the smoke cleared in December two thousand seven. But nobody knew we were in recession all the way up through Lehman Weekend. And then when Lehman Weekend happened, everyone sort of knew that was a disaster and we were going to actually have a very, very deep uh, recession. So typically recessions start long before anybody's actually identified it. And the National Bureau of Economic Research only dates the recession, you know, oftentimes a year and a half, two years later. So it wouldn't shock me at all if, you know, sometime in the first quarter we were in recession. We didn't know that. Fed didn't know that. Markets didn't know that. And you know, a year later, and it's, oh yeah, that's when the, the, the downturn actually started. I mean, right now we have a, a difficult economy to evaluate because we basically have a softness in the goods sector, uh, partly exacerbated by the pandemic itself because during the pandemic, people bought a lot of goods and they stayed at home. They didn't consume a lot of services. And now they're doing the opposite. <laughs> they're buying a lot of services. And they're not consuming a lot of goods. And so when you look at things that measure activity in the goods sector is pretty soft. And when you look at inflation in the goods sector, it's quite weak. But on the services side, things are still going uh, you know, great guns. And I think this is the problem that the Fed has is that the last mile on inflation is really about services prices. It's not about goods prices. And that last mile on inflation is really about slack in the labor market and getting wage gains down to a level consistent with 2% inflation. They're not there yet. And this last piece is the hardest piece to pull off. And how do you think that the strikes and the settlements that have recently been uh, agreed, UAW, Hollywood, uh, and so on, play into that idea about uh, what's happening? You know, it, could, it could affect psychology, but a lot of these settlements are sort of backward looking, like, you know, the, the auto workers were sort of not getting paid for during a period of very high inflation. And some of this is sort of catch up for what they actually experienced. So I guess I look at it as more of back, backward looking, catching up as opposed to forward looking, setting a whole new standard for uh, wage, wage inflation. Right. And Rory, what I took away from your last intervention was, yes, there's a range of probabilities, uh, probably better to uh, worry about, maybe in line with what Bill was saying, better to worry about inflation and act on that uh, in a risk adjusted way than to, because that's something that we see more immediately at any rate, than to uh, be concerned that we might fall into a recession that is very dangerous. It, it, was I right to interpret you that way? That's right, that's right. I mean, so, so to frame it in a slightly different way. So one of the explanations that Fed officials offered for, for not um, raising rates this most recent time was they said, well, there's been a tightening of financial conditions. You know, long end bond rates had, had risen pretty sharply. And the Fed argued that the market was doing some of its work for it. It was, it was tightening financial conditions, even without uh, an increase in, um, in Fed rates. But then what happened when, you know, the Fed didn't move, Markets. stocks stock, stocks rallied, bonds rallied, and all of a sudden um, financial conditions have eased not all the way, but qu quite a bit back to to where they were. So so it and 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 frankly, I think that a lot of people in the market listened to Chair Powell at his press conference and felt that he was looking for excuses not to to do more. Um, they, it, it was, it, he was interpreted as, as, as speaking very dovishly. I'm not sure that he necessarily intended to do that, but that's, that's how he was interpreted. And so that actually potentially makes his job harder. It means that, you know, rather than um, jawboning the market into, into doing the tightening for him, he might actually have to do the tightening himself. It did seem when he spoke at uh, an IMF conference after that, that he was tilting the other way. I will say that at Rock Creek, we did not and not did not interpret his comments uh, after November as being dovish. Uh, he was, in fact, quite careful to say, yes, financial conditions have been tightening because of uh, what's been happening at the long end, but we don't know if that's going to continue. So we might. Um, but I guess markets uh, heard or investors heard what they wanted to hear, which has been a, a phenomenon really uh, for a year. Bill, do you think that you can leave the markets to do the tightening uh, for the Fed or? You know, I think, it, I, I think you can't, you've got to be careful not to push that too far. So, I mean, for example, why are bond yields going up? 
they're going up because real rates are uh, need to be higher because monetary policy is not as tight as we think we are, and the Fed needs to continue to tighten. They're going up because inflation expectations are becoming less well anchored than the Federal Reserve has to tighten. It's only if it's the bond term premium that's the reason why bond yields are going up that that exerts f financial condition restraint. You know, I, I think you know when you listen to Chair Paul, I think what what what's what's dovish about what he said is that he's pretty optimistic about how the economy is performing. The labor market is normalizing it on its own. Wages are coming down. Uh, you know, so he, you know, the labor supply has increased. So a lot of the things that he's saying is that things are working out uh, more easily than what the Fed feared they would do uh, 12 months ago. So when the Fed started this tightening process, I think they were probably pretty nervous about how far they were behind the curve, probably pretty nervous about inflation expectations becoming unanchored, probably pretty nervous about how tight the labor market was already. And they've been pretty fortunate. Inflation expectations stayed well anchored. We got a big increase in labor supply over the past year that Paul talked about in his press conference. And so when people put all this together, they, 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 they hear a chairman that's sort of pleased by recent economic developments. Shouldn't he be pleased? No, he should be pleased. But that doesn't mean that uh, the next surprise will necessarily be on the positive side of the ledger. Right. And where are you looking for the surprise more on the jobs data, which, of course, we know unemployment's a backward uh, indicator, but there are all these uh, things that we've learned to look at, the jolts, the job openings and, and labor turnover numbers, uh, vacancies versus um, unemployed rates of quits and hires. Is it that sort of set of data or the inflation data? And of course, We've got the CPI, but we've got core, super core, uh, PCE, average earnings, employment costs, for a lot of different ways to measure inflation as well. So uh, are there particular indicators that you look at or are you most interested in looking at what's happening to the labor market or to uh, the measures of inflation? Well, I think the labor market is the thing that I'm sort of focused on right now, because if the labor market's too tight, wages are too high, and if wages are too high, then it's very hard to get back to 2% inflation. So that's sort of what I'd be focusing on. The other thing I would be focusing on in the labor market is what's happening to uh, people who are becoming more people are becoming longer term unemployed. So, you know, one thing that's sort of interesting, if you look right now, what's happening to continuing unemployment claims, they're climbing. So what that suggests is that people are leaving their jobs, either voluntarily or involuntary, and then they're having trouble finding a new job. And that's really sort of the leading edge of deterioration in the labor market when the duration of unemployment increases. So I'm, I'm really focused on what's happening to unemployment claims, what's happening to the, the duration of unemployment, because that's typically the leading edge of a deterioration in the US labor market. Rory? Yeah, I mean, we. I, I think that we are also very focused on the inflation data itself, not least because um, there, because of the the extremity of of the distortions during the pandemic itself. The, a lot of the the things that we rely on, like uh, seasonal adjustments in the data, have been thrown off in ways that we don't really understand, and so. Um, you, data that might seem benign one month may turn out to have been a head fake essentially just because of this you know even three years on a a, a lag in 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 um something that happened in 2020 2021 so so just even understanding the trend of the inflation data itself i mean no question that the labor market is going to be incredibly important i mean what you know the the fed has told us that just having fewer openings, even if you don't get higher unemployment, just having fewer openings is going to create less pressure on on wages. And you know, there's obviously a a logic to that, but we don't really know if that's true. We don't know if um, an economy with sub four percent unemployment, you know, is is compatible with uh, with 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 a declining you know inflation on a declining path down to two percent. And even if it is on a on a declining path to 2%. We don't know whether it will stay there, whether some shock from commodities or you know, some other a price shock could just send um, inflation right back up again, much as it did in the 1970s. So, so you know, clearly the, the, you know, the in labor market is incredibly important. It's something that we don't 
really have, I think, a very good grip on. And then, you know, just in the near t near term, the inflation data itself. You've already Thanks. made a lot of good points yeah. there. Uh, I think, you know, another big sort of uncertainty is what's productivity growth going to be over the next few years. You know, productivity growth has been all over the place over the last couple of years as we shut down the economy and then reopened it. I have no idea what the underlying productivity trend, and that's really very important in terms of thinking about how fast can you grow without having an inflation problem. Absolutely. And that's affected also by what's happening with immigration, which was another issue that uh, that Chair Powell raised, that there were more people coming here for work. But that's obviously politically uh, challenging in, in some ways. I want to uh, pick up on what Rory said about there could be a commodity price shock. Obviously, uh, now, this month, this this year, we have experienced and are experiencing all these geopolitical tensions. Uh, maybe things are getting better, might get better between the US and China, which at the beginning of the year or last year might have seemed like the big issue. Uh, we'll see how that goes with the APEC meetings. But we know that obviously there was the um, Hamas barbaric attack on uh, Israel and then Israel's response. So far, oil prices seem to have stayed anchored. The continued war in Europe uh, with Russia's invasion of Ukraine also obviously led to a big a jump in oil prices and food prices, but that hasn't continued this year. Markets seem to sort of take these geopolitical events almost in their stride. Is that because it's too hard to price or because in the end it doesn't actually affect, um, it doesn't affect the kinds of things that uh, in the US, the US economy? Uh, I want to go to you, Bill. And if you think about when you were on the FOMC, how much did you worry about those sorts of of events, and how much did you think, well, actually, we we're relatively insulated here? Well, we certainly want to consider all events that are happening in the world and how they might affect the U.S. economy. Obviously, like when I was at the New York Fed, the Europeans were going through a very difficult situation with Greece, and we were very concerned about how that was going to play out. Is it going to play out in a very disruptive way or, or, or not? So we certainly keep our eyes on all, all those kind of things. I think the issue right now is, are we going to have a narrow war between Israel and Hamas? Or are we going to have a much broader war? If we have a much broader war, then I think the energy sector, you know, is, is, is very vulnerable to a pretty significant shock. You know, the Fed tends to look through uh, price shocks uh, as long as they think that they're temporary rather than permanent. Uh, what caused a lot of the inflation in the 1970s, though, was that the price shocks in oil, in the oil market were persistent. Went from $3 a barrel oil to $10 a barrel oil in 73, 74. And then we went to $30 a barrel oil in 78, 79, and we didn't go back down uh, so, for, for, for many, until, until many years later. So I think, you know, it's the persistence of the price shocks that really matters rather than sort of temporary shifts in relative prices that last, you know, a year or or 18 months, the Fed tends to look through those. Yeah, it's interesting because it's not clear that consumers look through them, at least politically. Uh, people are very upset with prices going up, uh, precisely the prices that the Fed will uh, put to one side when it looks at core prices, excluding food and fuel. Those are probably the prices that the consumer uh, minds about most and notices most. But Rory, as, a, as an investor, Yourself, how do you think about these geopolitical tensions? I mean, I think the first thing to say is that if you if we were talking in Europe, th there's no way that you would ever say that these geopolitical tensions had not had an economic impact because the the huge spike in gas prices um, last fall, basically in in European gas prices, and this, now I'm talking about natural gas, not gasoline. Um, had, you know, I think that that's part of what the uh, European economy is still digesting today, just this big terms of trade shock and replacing Russian gas with with liquefied natural gas from the United States and from the Middle East is not a one for one swap. The, the Russian gas was considerably cheaper for the European economy than than the gas that they're buying now. So so. Europe has had to swallow a very severe terms of trade shock from these geopolitical tensions. I, I think that what's striking 
with with the current Middle East conflict is that you know there was a, a little bit of a run up in oil prices at the beginning because people were bracing for you know a broader war you know Iran getting involved the Straits of Hormuz potentially being blocked and you know and, and that being one of the major uh, sources of of oil for the entire world and um and obviously that has not yet happened and in fact oil prices now are are more or less where they were and so uh you know so far so benign but um you know and obviously this is just speaking in a narrowly economic yes. sense because there's yes. nothing benign about the the actual situation itself um but uh you know clearly this is something that that I think uh, the investment community is watching very carefully to see whether whether there is uh, any kind of broader um, spread of of the conflict. Right. Yeah, and the U.S. U.S. is a bit insulated from a lot of these energy risks because we're a big energy producer now. We're basically positive. You know, we, when energy prices go up, it actually stimulates economic activity in the U.S. to some degree because uh, the shale oil uh, production ramps up, uh, natural gas production ramps up. And so the U.S. is in a very different uh, place than countries that are dependent on foreign uh, energy imports. Yeah, no, that's an important point. I wanted to ask, maybe that's one reason why the uh, situation has been so different in Europe. I wanted to just ask, as many people have said, uh, the inflation in the U.S., the inflation research has tended to be uh, blamed on uh, the fiscal stimulus that took place during the pandemic, um, both under former President Trump and under President Biden. And then, as you said just now, Bill, a somewhat delayed response of the Fed. But Europe had a, an inflation surge as well. And um, in some cases worse than the one in the United States, it's also turned around. So some uh, people view that as evidence that actually this was a global phenomenon, much more than uh, something that can be pinned on U.S. policy. I guess a different way to look at it is, well, the U.S. drives the world. And so the inflation, inflation research elsewhere uh, basically came from from here, as well as from the conflict in, in Europe. I'd like to get your take first, Bill, and then Rory on, well, if the causes were so specific to US policy, the causes of the inflation, uh, why did the inflation happen everywhere? Well, I think the causes of the inflation in different places were certainly different. I think in the US, it was really about uh, uh, overly aggressive fiscal policy stimulus so that when the economy uh, opened up, you had a big expansion of, de of demand. But the other thing I think that, that there, are, there are also common factors. I mean. The COVID pandemic caused tremendous frictions everywhere in terms of the ability of people to work, the ability of people to you know, source the goods that they needed, the supply chain disruptions. That was a global phenomenon. That wasn't a US phenomenon. And of course, in the case of Europe, they had a big energy price shock, as Rory said, on top of that. So you know, the, the, everyone had inflation, I think, because of the frictions. The sources of the inflation beyond that were different depending on where you, what, what country you were in. Rory. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that one other way of, of of looking at this, I mean, clearly there was a, you know, a a trans a, a transient component to inflation from the supply chain disruptions and and the the really massive shift from uh, of consumption into to goods from ser from services in the beginning of the pandemic, um, in the emerging world, and um, there was a smaller fiscal response and a more rapid monetary response. I mean, in the large emerging markets like you know the Mexicos, the Brazils, and uh, Eastern Europe, and so you are seeing that they are, you know, further along in this cycle. Uh, a number of emerging economies have already started cutting rates because uh, you know their inflation is coming down quite nicely. So I think that everything is as you would expect based on the textbook here that you know the 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 places that just did much more fiscal stimulus i mean the europeans did quite a lot of fiscal stimulus including um uh, a, a lot of money that was uh, given to households to help cushion the blow of the energy shock last winter and you know and so all of this has 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 generated uh, or made it more challenging for for policymakers to bring inflation down um although and, it's uh, come down a fair amount it has, but it's not where they want it to be. Not where they want it to be, for sure. 
I think we you've certainly uh, seemed to conclude that rates are going to stay higher for longer, uh, whether that's just through 2024 or, or much beyond that. Uh, and I know that there are recent, uh, some of the Wall Street uh, analyses recently are suggesting that actually rates are going to start to be cut in the middle of next year. But let's put that to one side. What do you see for investors in 2024? I'm going to go first to you, Rory both in bond markets and uh, equity markets, if rates do stay uh, higher? So, I mean, I think that rates staying higher is, I would say, our main scenario. Um, but that's talking about short end rates. But then a very significant question for the markets is what happens to longer end rates. And as was implied by things I said earlier, um, you know, our view is that they could potentially go up quite a bit as the market tries to digest just the the sheer volume of bond issuance coming out of you know primarily the the United States but the United States is not the only country to be running uh, yeah. significant budget deficits as well so and 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 that itself can be obviously a little bit of a, a drag on on other asset prices it could be a huge it, it, you know, when we talk about crowding out, we classically think about the government um, drawing an in investment away from the private sector. But this, in 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 global terms, the crowding out could be from, for example, emerging markets. That you know, instead of capital flowing to the emerging world, it all gets sucked into the United States. And so, you know, I have no worries about the U.S. being able to fund its budget deficit, but things get might get broken along the way as it does so. And I think that there's no likelihood that there will be any significant fiscal adjustment in the United States, at least until 2025. And so in that context, you know, 2024 could be a, a, a challenging year for other assets. Right. And that includes uh, equity markets that will be it seen. It clearly includes equity markets. I mean, it, it could be a very good year for the dollar. Just because this is, you know, that's that's what it looks like when the U.S. pulls in a lot of money from the rest of the world. Yeah, and um, Bill, I'd like to hear your take on on that, obviously, and also on how does this, uh, how should the markets and how should investors be thinking about what is likely to be not just a failure to reduce deficits over the longer term, but potentially repeated uh, fears of government shutdown and, and so on. Maybe that is not a government shutdown is not as scary as uh, running up against the debt ceiling, because at least it uh, government may shut down, but we'll go on servicing uh, our debts. But how do you see that as well as uh, the higher for longer impact? Well, government shutdowns are disruptive in the short term to certainly the government workers and, and certainly to people who want to go on vacation to national parks and things like that. But they de generally don't create lasting damage to the economy because the government workers ultimately get paid even if they're uh, off the job for, for a few weeks. I think the government shutdown issue is really more uh, a, a symptom of greater dis government dysfunction. And the, as, as Rory said, there, there's no chance of doing anything significant on fiscal policy until 2025 at the earliest. And doing something in 2025 presumes that you don't have divided government in, in Washington. So I personally think that we're gonna have a, a market problem that's gonna force the fiscal adjustment rather than Congress and the new administration doing what they need to do to essentially get ahead of the curve. Like Bill Clinton got ahead of the curve in 1993-94. The Clinton administration, that was a famous situation where the bond market vigilantes were there and James Carville didn't want to come back, wanted to come back as, as the bond market because the bond market always gets its way. Well, that provoked the, uh, that, that was the motivation for the Clinton administration to be quite prudent on fiscal policy. And they were, were rewarded for that by real rates coming down, which then stimulated the economy and actually generated uh, uh, a big improvement in the government finances. I mean, remember at the end of the 1990s, we're even talking about, oh, we're going to be, we're going to have to pay down all the debt. What are we going to do when there's no more government debt outstanding? It seems um, you know, was worried absolutely about ludicrous that. today when you when you think about that. But uh, so I think I think I think Roy is absolutely right. It's going to be a bad situation. It's just hard to know when the you know, the markets start to balk in a, in a serious way.
and then balking would uh, would be more likely to be a sharp increase in rates than uh, something else. Yeah, and and, it'll, and of course it'll spill over into other markets because the, the treasury market's the benchmark. So if I, if I can invest in treasury bonds yielding 6%, then that has real implications for the price earnings ratio in the US stock market. It's implications for corporate bonds and then pretty much all other asset classes. Yeah, well, it's a pretty gloomy uh, outlook, but I guess I, I don't know what each of you was thinking at the beginning of 2022, which of course turned out to be a disappointing year in markets, whereas this year has been um, much better. So um, I don't know if it'd be interesting to hear why was 2022 so bad? Maybe it was just the, the sharp increases in short rates versus what's happened so, so far in 2023? Has there been sort of problems building up that are going to come or might the pessimism be overdone? Well, 2022 is the end of the biggest bull market in treasuries that had lasted since the early 1980s. So you can sort of understand that if you're in a 40 year bull market, when that bull market ends, that's uh, uh, pretty yeah. traumatic. Uh, and we've been in a, you know, a low, for long, uh, low for long period since the great financial crisis. And I think what people got wrong uh, in 2022 and into 2023 was the, the, the economic expansion following the great financial crisis was not the right template for the current economic expansion. Uh, there wasn't the amount of, of damage to uh, household and business balance sheets. There was a tremendous amount of fiscal uh, support this time when there wasn't much fiscal support back in 2011, 2012. So people who were thinking that the, this business cycle was going to be about like the last, last business cycle were, you know, rudely uh, disappointed by that. And that's what caused the market to adjust. And of course, the Fed was late. And so the Federal Reserve had to go much faster than they would typically have, have moved if they had, had been more preemptive in terms of monetary policy. Yeah, I, I want to go to Rory, but also to say, well, uh, it wasn't this this uh, response has not been and the situation has not been nearly the same as it was after the global financial crisis. Maybe that is a reason for some optimism, even if the Fed doesn't quite manage to thread the needle of uh, of a soft landing. Uh, the kinds of uh, hard landings that we've been used to maybe are not likely to come now. So I'm trying to tease some optimism out of out of Rory. <laughs> Well, I, I think that it is, I mean, one thing that has been remarkable so far is that there was one of the reasons for pessimism at the beginning of this year um, and, uh, and, and you know, last year as well, one of the reasons that people were predicting a recession is that they, they reasoned that if you suddenly go from 15 years of zero interest rates to 5% interest rates in the space of 12 months, that things will break, that there will be, um, you know, there's the famous Buffett line about you only know who's swimming naked when the tide goes out. And, you know, so I think that there was the assumption that there were a lot of people who were swimming naked. In, yeah, in one way or another, they, they built business models around zero rates lasting forever. And that wasn't entirely wrong. <laughs> it turned out that there were some number of regional banks and 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 other financial institutions that had essentially betted that um, that that uh, they could reach for yield by you know buying a lot of long term um, government bonds that uh, they funded with short term deposits and that proved to be for a handful of institutions a real problem. But I think that one of the surprises is is that there hasn't been more. Um, there was a blow up in the British uh, pension industry briefly, but um, but you might have expected that more there there would be more breakage around the financial system, around uh, around the economy, and it's just been really striking how much resilience this this economy has shown. And I think that um, as you both have said, I mean a lot of it is because households and 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 businesses and and financial institutions are all just in much better uh, shape. They have much stronger balance sheets than they did going into two thousand and eight, and so we 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 don't have those um, you know th th those real structural problems like, for example, the Chinese clearly do. The U.S. is just not facing the same kind of uh, challenges of 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 
repair that we did in in 2008 2009 you think about it a little bit like the great financial crisis swept away all the weak structures and we haven't had enough time for new bad structures to sort of <laughs> to regenerate themselves uh, or so maybe or maybe reforms and policies help well, that's helped too that's helped too i mean the banking system clearly is a lot healthier i mean the basel reforms more capital higher quality capital you know, more liquidity all those things have helped but I mean, I think it's you also a lot of weak structures just got, you know, vanished, and yet, you know, and even in the problems that we had in the Mar in March in the U.S. banking system, totally different than the Great Financial Crisis. It's all happening in plain sight. You could just look at their earnings reports. You could understand exactly what their problems are, what the pressure was on the net interest margin, how the deposits were being repriced. The Great Financial Crisis. I remember calling up someone during the middle of the Great Financial Crisis and asking him, "How long would it take uh, that, that this person on Wall Street to 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 evaluate complex CDO?" He said, oh, "I could get, I could value that in about three weeks." Well, I knew if it took three weeks to one, value to one problem. CDO, we were in really deep trouble. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, that's a very good uh, metric. Picking up on that, Bill, uh, you were president of the Fed, obviously, in those times. Are there? Were there lessons then that you think are relevant now for monetary policy and uh, and uh, policymakers more general, more generally, or is the situation so different that there that there really are not? I think the situation is pretty different, but I think you know in every uh, you know business cycle, don't be overconfident about what you think you know. <laughs> Uh, you know, remember the f famous uh, view that subprime lending in the U.S. wasn't very big, and therefore the, what couldn't cause much problems for the for the U.S. economy. Uh, yeah. or, or this time, where the Fed basically changed its monetary policy regime on purpose to be late, and then look at all the inflation that came back. So, you know, your presumption that the next business cycle is always going to be like the last one uh, typically turns out to be wrong. And so, I think you need to be much more, uh, I don't know, agnostic about uh, what you know, what you think you know <laughs> versus what you actually know about what's going to happen uh, in the business cycle. Agnostic and therefore maybe also agile and, uh, and flexible. And uh, Rory, I'd be interested in, uh, you, you were in a different uh, part of the government uh, after that time. Is there, are there lessons that you think um, carry over from then and and maybe also including uh, on Europe bill mentioned earlier the problems that there were in Europe some people are worrying about italian bonds even even today yeah so so i think that one of the the things one of the 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 problems this time that if you cast your mind back to 2009, 2010, would have seemed like a high quality problem is the fact that the fiscal response was so strong, um, you know, as, as we've already discussed, arguably too strong. But in the Obama years, the, you know, we, we, we had the opposite problem. We had um, essentially after the first two years, we had no ability to, to do any kind of proactive policy really in any area and fiscal policy was 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 constantly on a contractionary path um, even as the Fed was unable to meet its inflation targets from the low end rather than from the high end and and so you know just as we probably overcompensated in um, in 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 this most recent uh, crisis you know, a little more fiscal support, I think, would have would have really made the the post financial crisis period. Um, you know, we we now remember it as this period of slow growth and you know a really kind of difficult recovery, and obviously a period where U.S. politics got particularly toxic. And I, I think those those phenomena are related. And you know, if if the fiscal policy regime had been just that much looser, I think we would have been in a better place in all sorts of respects today. Yes, and maybe I'm, I'm going to give the last word to uh, Bill, but as you were talking about how the mistakes of, uh, of, of that period maybe led to mistakes in the opposite direction now, we're also talking about the balance sheets of the private sector, industry, and financial sector so much stronger. 
this time around or right now, and that's helped to moderate um, any downside from from the interest rate, uh, sharp interest rate increases. But of course, the outstanding, the uh, part of the economy that is not so well balanced is the government. <laughs> and uh, maybe that's better than the other sectors because the government can in the end in the US at any rate finance itself. Uh, but maybe that's more worrying. Uh, I, I would ask uh, Bill to comment from the point of view of also a former monetary policy official who had to deal with the vagaries of, of uh, fiscal, fiscal policy in the US. Well, the central bank has to take fiscal policy as it is not fiscal policy as it wishes it would be. Uh, and, you know, Chair Powell has been asked about fiscal policy and he doesn't really, he doesn't want to talk about it. He doesn't want to put the Fed in the middle of the political debate. Um, I think that the fiscal situation as we've talked about today is, is on an unsustainable path. Uh, it, it, it can go on longer than households and businesses becoming too indebted because they're constrained by cash flow and their income and their ability to service their debt. The government can service its debt by issuing more debt. So this process can be sustained for quite a bit longer, but it doesn't, uh, it, it can't be sustained indefinitely. And so I think that you know, we are building up a pretty sizable imbalance here uh, that's going to have to be resolved. And I'm, I'm guessing it's going to be resolved in the, within a few years. Okay, well, we just have to hope that that's resolved in a soft way and that the Fed manages to do its soft landing. Thank you very much, uh, Bill, William Dudley and Rory McFarqua for joining us. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. So thank you both. For